Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of I Like to Read with me, your host, Rachel Polanski. It's May. We got another hot afternoon in Los Angeles. Um, I mean, part of the reason, sometimes I'm like, you know, it's hard to make these episodes like over 20-ish, 25 minutes. Um, Sometimes, you know, if we add a little bonus fun content like quizzes, it can take a bit longer, but it's exa- not exhausting, but you know, if it's not scripted, obviously like I have the books planned in advance, sometimes I have like a little more thought put into some formatting of things and whatnot, um, but unless it's like a conversation with somebody else, as you'll have noticed, um, this is also a plug for my awesome conversation with Andromeda Romano Lax that will be linked down below. Make sure you check that out if you have not already. Um, we discuss Annie and the Wolves, which is her most recent book featured on a recent episode of mine. We discuss Plum Rains, her book she published before that, also featured on another episode of mine, um, and just the craft of writing, and she's written a ton of wonderful, diverse fiction novels, um, and it was really wonderful to chat with her, so that is linked down below. Like I said, check it out if you have not already, um, and that was about, I believe, 45 minutes, and definitely, like, felt like I could have talked to her a little bit longer, and we did a little more chatting, you know, offline, um, but it's, you know, when you're talking about yourself unscripted, it's hard to, because you're, like, one, you know, your mouth gets tired, and your voice, and you're exhausted, but also just like you need a little bit of a break and you need like the banter of somebody else or like a script at least that's you don't have to do like the active thinking at the moment so it's a lot harder than I realized so like kudos to everybody who keeps a podcast going the motivation to record every week obviously I'm doing the reading so like the base material is there but it's definitely like not the easiest to motivate myself I'm not gonna lie um but I hope you guys enjoy it you know I want to keep this going (laughs) for the fans you know I do love reading so much that I think it would be a shame not to share that in some capacity um so you know we'll, we'll, we'll keep going we'll keep plugging away for the foreseeable future um but I do apologize about the random release schedule I think we are going to um unofficially slash officially shift our release date to Mondays instead of Sundays. So um, if you previously saw that in your subscriptions or your podcast feed on Sundays, I think we will now be out on Mondays just for logistical reasons and whatnot. Um, And last before we, but not least before we get started, I know in the episode before Andromeda, I discussed my top five um, non-true crime podcast favorites. And I don't think I included Frenemies, which huge oversight, but I think the reason that I didn't um, is because I typically view Frenemies, I only <laughs> view Frenemies as a video. I do think they release their audio as well. Um, it's the podcast with Ethan Klein from H3 Productions and the Queen, Trisha Paytas. Um, and like, I'm so used to that popping up on Tuesdays in my YouTube feed as opposed to my podcast feed. So I just don't think I even thought of it as a podcast, but that's what its intended medium was initially and what they still, um, you know, it's part of the H3 podcast and it's the Frenemies video podcast. So um, I definitely recommend checking that out for just like all sorts of like fun YouTube drama and fun competitions that the two of them do together. Their chemistry is top notch. I uh, love my queen Trisha Paytas. Now I'm a fan of Ethan Klein, really didn't know who he was uh, prior to this podcast, but it's made me a fan as well. Um, so I'm amiss that I did not introduce that but I'm watching the newest episode today actually in the middle of it and took a break to record so and that's why I felt the need to plug that right now um and also because I am recording a little bit later in the week and I actually skipped the recording of the the weekly books last week because of my conversation with Andromeda we have six books again um so you know this won't be a long one but it'll be a good one of course here for a long time or for here for a good time not a long time (laughs) Anyway, is our first book that we are discussing that I'm going to tell you about. We um, is Good Company by Cynthia D'Apri Sweeney. Um, this was a again a multi. I think this uh, there's sort of a theme uh, sort of to the books in this uh, episode are the ruminations of women at different points in their lives, uh, which sounds vague, but trust me, I think you, you'll understand it a little more as we get into it. Maybe I'll come to like a more nuanced thesis than that um but at the moment that's kind of like what's jump oh and also like with the specificity of california being um prevalent to four of the six so i guess that's you know uh 60 percent or something like that uh okay no yeah two four six eight Yeah, something, I don't know. Uh, (laughs) You asked me to do math right now, I'm like, who's my mind? Um, Okay, so yes, good company. Um, Our main character is Flora Mancini. Um, We learn that Flora is married to a man named Julian, um, and then they are also sort of a couple friends with another couple. Um, It's David, and what's the other woman's name? 
uh, Margo, da, 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 da. yeah, Mark. So Margo, um, it's kind of told in like alternating timelines as well. So we learned that the friends grew up and got to know each other, um, and then they all sort of like formed this theater company, which is the Good Company. Um, and it was really fun to just like see community theater and this like vibrant sort of like Berkshires esque um, theater troupe and company come alive so vividly in this novel as a you know theater uh theater lover uh, myself um and a participant in high school and middle school um i think there's a lot of humor and thought put into the way that these relationships evolve or don't evolve to some um, extent the sort of continuing thread is their daughter ruby um who is you know we she is a young child when they first uh, formed this theater company and sort of the evolution of ruby as a human and her own coming of age uh, reflects the ups and downs of owning a small and intimate theater company as well. Um, so the way that the theater company and the theater scene is also contrasted with like the Los Angeles acting scene and what it means to be an aging woman in Hollywood and an aging woman still wanting to act on screen and like owning your self-worth versus like owning your craft and what the public expects of you. Um, all that is explored really well um, in a sort of lighter but still... Um, what's the word I'm looking for, like a way that gets, but it's still, um, you know, it's accessible and gets across to you very well. So that is Good Company by Cynthia Diapri Sweeney. Pause for the water break. Um, next we have When the Stars Go Dark, Paula McLean. This one was really cool because it takes, um, the real life stories and real life true crime cases and then interweaves a fictional detective in them um and we get to know her perspective so it's definitely like based on true crime and based on real events in these very real prominent cases one of them is the case of polly Kalaus, i believe her name um she was a young child yeah polly I'm feeling like adult here. Um, there was Polly Kloss. Yeah, she was taken in the early 90s in Petaluma. And I know about that because of my favorite murder, Karen Kogara. That's sort of like her hometown murder and her hometown lore that she talks a lot about. Um, so Anna is our main detective. She has a childhood past and childhood trauma. She's on the scene to figure out what happened to Polly. Um, she sort of just like ends up there accidentally and sees the way that the community responds to the missing person um, and the way that that like affects her ongoing investigation. Um, there's definitely also like a little bit of fantastical, uh, you know, it's historical fiction. I mean, with true crime elements, I would be hesitant to call it a, I'm sorry, I have a hangnail. <laughs> Fascinating stuff, right? Um, I would be hesitant to call it like, you know, it's definitely, it's fiction. It is a you know, based on a true story, but a fictional element. And that's kind of like a murky territory because I am hoping and imagining that the author, you know, and I think she mentioned br this briefly in the author's note, but I haven't run it for a couple of weeks. So excuse me if I'm messing that up, but I think it's, you know, she got to know these families well, and I'm sure took some grace and liberty with getting to know the real people and faces behind these stories. Um, and, you know, not glorifying them in any sense. There's really not any of that at all um it's sort of you know there is a redemptive community um hopeful element to it as well because these cases happen in the time right when like dna was on the verge of becoming a big thing but we still relied a lot on like you know eyewitness testimony as problematic as it is and you know you relied on first person accounts and someone knowing someone and you know someone actually being there as opposed to like actual dna evidence um so it has that thriller, fantastical element to it. It has a really great detective character in Anna Hart. I think because she is fictional, I don't pers I don't know off the top of my head the detectives who actually worked on the case. Um, the author was able to take a lot more liberty liberties in terms of like getting to know her stream of consciousness and really like forging this fully fictional character who serves as a stand-in for the audience, of course. Uh, so I really, really enjoyed reading that one. It's a little bit of a longer one, a little over 400 pages, but trust me, it flows well and it's definitely worth it. Next we have Early Morning Riser by Katherine Heine. Um, so this also reminded me of Good Company in the sense that it's, again, just sort of about the everyday lives of women and the sort of the moments in between the big moments and how those can actually become bigger than the big moments and how the, you know, looking back, how they impact our lives. But of course, hindsight is 2020. Um, so Jane is a young woman who we meet. Um, she falls in love with a man named Duncan. I need to like reacquaint myself with some of the details. This is terrible. <laughs> 
because I read it a couple weeks ago and I remember like loving it so much at the time, but I've just like read like 10 books since then. So I'm like, ah. um, yes. Okay. So Jane, right. She falls in love with this man named Duncan. He's definitely a little bit older um, and sort of like a mythical figure in this small town that they moved to in Michigan. Um, and then it turns out that Duncan's ex-wife um, is still involved in his life and also, right. Okay. No, now I'm remembering. Okay. I'm like bringing back the details reading the summer right so there's she falls in love with him and there's sort of this like will they won't they element throughout the entire novel and we get to know Jane as a character see this is you know you get the real time sort of what's going on in my brain this is not <laughs> it's all just coming at you part of me is like do I want to edit that out but I'm like no you want to hear the real the real the real me the real the real, the real. right um so Jane is our main character um she falls in love with a man named Duncan at the beginning of the novel and then the rest of the novel is sort of Jane going through the motions of life getting married motherhood you know forming friendships and relationships and figuring out her career all to the background of this older man named Duncan and um it's no the way that she marries or doesn't marry him I'm not going to give that part away um though it's by no means a thriller um but then there is sort of in uh in enticing into <laughs> we've never figured out enticing enticing and so there's a climactic incident that brings all the relationships together and really like changes Jane's perspective of herself I know I'm being vague but I, like I don't want to give away too many details um just because then you sort of like lose it's not again it's not a very plot heavy novel it's what happens in life in the everyday moments that we then look back on but um they're just brought to life really well um it's sort of you know what hap how do we define and search for happiness and like again like I said you know keep looking back we don't realize some of the moments of importance until they've already passed um and it's almost like the memory of the important is more important than the moment itself um and how do we how do we capture that in a book and I think Catherine Heining does a really good job of that pause for a water break one moment speaking of the moments in between and you know what could have been and thinking about, you know, a life and existential crises. Next up, we have The Other You Stories by Joyce Carol Oates. I'm sure that name is familiar to a lot of you. She's a wonderful author. She's been writing stuff for God knows how long, uh, longer than I've been alive. Spoiler. <laughs> Spo not a spoiler, but, you know, she's just a prolific author. Um, So I've definitely mentioned one of her collections of short stories on the podcast before I think Cardiff by the Sea. Um, so this is her most recent one came in from the library. Um, and this really the theme of the short stories is sort of the metaphysical the as this the title states the other you and confronting our um, different selves, whether that's literally, you know, different forms of ourselves coming to life in person, whether that's different forms of ourselves in terms of different paths and different choices we could have made. Um, there's sort of an ongoing story throughout the short stories that there's a uh a cafe that is sort of like the central place where a lot of these characters converge. Um, some characters swoop in and out of other stories, and that's always kind of fun when the stories themselves are really great and easy to read. Some are uh, just a few pages. Some are a little bit longer. Um, none of them are close to the length of a novella. So again, if you're intimidated by lots of words and long stories and reading, this is definitely a great one to pick up. And then at the end, you'll have a nice sort of surprise tie. Not all short stories do this and not all of them do it well, but this one does again, where having this sort of central location that's not prominent in every story, but is sort of the metaphysical limbo, you know, the, the medium place or the place or whatever where the other you can live and the way that she um, takes this sort of basic uncanny sense of not knowing yourself, which is like one of the, the scariest thoughts on earth, like thinking you know yourself and then something makes you realize you don't know yourself. Um, so she definitely just continues to bang out wonderful stories. And I think Cardiff by the Sea came out a year ago, if not less. So um, while I think a lot of these stories have already been published in other places and then they were sort of brought together in this collection, um, some may have been created specifically for this, definitely highly recommend. And next we have Crying in H Mart by Michelle Zauner a memoir uh, that's not technically in the Goodreads title, but it's like on the cover. So I'm going to, I'm going to put that in. Um, this is a really powerful memoir about grief and the power that it can have over you. So definitely if you have experienced a loss in your life recently that you are still struggling with and is very fresh and new for you, um, nothing I'm going to say may trigger you, but this is such a visceral 
powerful memoir that I think if you're still very fresh and new, this will be great for you to come back to, but you may want to still, um, this may be triggering and uncomfortable and not in a good way for you. So I'm just going to put that out there. Um, Michelle Zauner, it opens up with her finding out that her mother has cancer. She doesn't have very long to live. So that she then goes home and tries to reconnect with her mother. She's in her mid to late 20s, I believe. So, you know, around my age, which is like a horrifying thought to think like, your mother is your rock and everything is fine. And then all of a sudden it's not. And so that causes her to re-examine her childhood and re-examining her life and her Korean identity as well. Um, her mother is Korean. Um, so her mother used to take her back to Korea every year and the relationship she has with the family there and the sense of otherness, um, because her mother is from there. Her father, I believe, is American or was born in Korea, but moved to America when he was young. So he considers himself American. Um, it's definitely very just like pouring her heart out. I believe she is actually a musician and she goes by the name Japanese Breakfast, which is really cool. Um, so while part of this is definitely that like, you know, coming of age, like figuring out her path in the artistic world and a little bit about like her musical endeavors, it's a lot more about like how her mom has shaped her identity and how her mom like inadvertently led her to that path. Um, I had never heard of her before this memoir, but it had been on my to read list for a while and I was lucky to get a hold on it pretty recently from the library. It is... Uh, definitely a quick read, like about 250 pages, very visceral, very raw, just like gives you a peek into Michelle's heart and she like, not even a peek, just like a very good look into her heart and she really like ripped it open and laid it all out for us and it's not easy or um, by any means to do that. And so power to you, Michelle, and this is a wonderful memoir. What a break. <laughs> and last, but certainly not least, we have Wind Hall by Ava Berry. This um, takes a look into the old Hollywood scene of Los Angeles with a, again, based on real characters and based on real events. However, the main uh, event surrounding the mystery of this novel is fictional. It's based on the character of Eleanor. <laughs> I just can't speak. Um, Eleanor is a famous starlet in the 1940s who is found murdered at the titular house Wind Hall, which is fictional. Um, and then sh she is supposed to have been found murdered by this man named Theo. Um, it becomes this sort of like, OJ, did he or did he not do it? He ends off like getting off the trial on a technicality. I'm not giving anything away here. It's all like explained in like the first five or 10 pages. Um, and that sort of becomes this like mythical Los Angeles case that sort of like, did Theo wrongly get away with this? Like who murdered Eleanor? She was like this golden star it right on the rise and they all sort of represented um you know all the studios and all the other actors and people that they talk about are real of course these characters are fictional but i'm sure you know based on real people so that mystery reverberates into present day when we meet our protagonist max haley um max works at a newspaper he's sort of on the brink of like the next big story and really finding the next big thing um, for reasons disclosed in the novel, Wind Hall and the murder of Eleanor really resonate with him. Um, his grandmother grew up around that time in Los Angeles and sort of was on the periphery of the scene. So he takes it under his hand to investigate you know, whether or not Theo really did it. And that sp burns up a whole lot of craziness. Um, Wind Hall as a setting is really cool. It's told, you know, both in the past and the present and we get to know excuse me, anecdotally what happened through the like journals and, you know, interviews. And while it's all fictional and it's all very believable and definitely like steeped in that mythical golden age of Hollywood, while um, also, you know, focused in contemporary Los Angeles and making the city come to life in a, in a new way. So that was just like a fun mystery with some also, you know, biting remarks about Hollywood without being like too much. It's, you know, definitely more about like, just like the characters and solving the mystery and how it will impact their lives with the undertone of the Hollywood stuff um, while still making a point, of course. Um, so <laughs> all over the place, but we did it, folks. It's hot. I'm going to turn on my air conditioner. Um, let me know what you're reading. Rate, review, subscribe. Leave me a review on iTunes, on YouTube. Um, and until next time, stay reading. Bye.